Kessel, Longview. How's everybody doing? You guys excited? Man, Friday, an amazing day. Really, really good. We had all the speakers up here on stage, and the community came out and just asked them a ton of questions, and we actually had to stop the questioning because it kept going and going and going, and probably would have went until at least 12 o'clock at night. But um, yeah, they really drilled them. That was great. Our first speaker today is Dr. Jeff Meldrum. He's going to come up and talk to you guys. Um, he's got a great presentation. He did really well yesterday, and I'm um, looking forward to listening to his presentation again. And uh, let's welcome Dr. Jeff Meldrum. That was a diplomatic way of saying Dr. Miller was really long-winded and he hugged my all my lines today. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to be here. There were great, great questions and great responses and discussion. I really enjoyed it. I was commenting to someone I thought that was one of the best panel discussions that, that I participated in in, in a while. So it was, a, it was good. All right, so it's always a challenge. Thanks again for inviting me back. It's always a pleasure to come up to this part of the country and and, uh, and run shoulders to good stories and, and experiences that, that you have to share. And I wish we had more time. I know sometimes it gets a little hectic out there. And I wish we could spend more time with, with each of you individually, but uh, the best we can. Uh, it's always a challenge to but as time goes on, it's always a challenge to remember what I talked about last year. But it's always a challenge to try to give you some fresh perspective and present something that will uh, will uh, provoke your thinking and uh, your evaluation of the evidence for, for this you know, remarkable phenomenon that has occupied so much of my attention for the past uh, couple of decades or more plus. So, because of some recent um, events, some, some recent uh, postings from individuals and questions, um, commentary uh, by some, it, it became clear to me, I, on the one hand, I'm gratified that, that you all can use the term mid-parcel break, mid-parcel break, uh, relic, hominoid, you know, these technical terms are rolling off your tongues with more and more frequency and ease. And that's great, uh, as long as you understand what it is that you're saying. And that was what kind of prompted this review and, and sort of uh, retrenchment of some basic principles, which for some of you will be uh, probably self-evident, but uh, hopefully this will present in a coherent way that reinforces your understanding. And for those of you who are perhaps a little newer or less familiar with this interpretation, this conclusion, this inference, more than just a personal opinion or interpretation, this will be a good primer, a good uh, footprints 101. Um, you see already I lost my train of thought. I was going to say something else and just looked up. <laughs> but, uh, uh, okay, so anyway, so that's that's the purpose of, of, of this morning's uh, presentation, the mid-tarsal break, the term tarsal, or, or the, referring to the tarsus, that's the collection of bones at your ankle, essentially just the, the ankle bone, the heel bone, and a few others that you're a little less familiar with just before we get out to the digits. One of the characteristics that typifies the Sasquatch foot, I should have always been saying, uh, that typifies the Sasquatch foot and distinguishes it from the human anatomy is the presence of the, this mid partial break. It's really kind of a central feature of the architectural adaptation of the Sasquatch foot. What I was going to say was just about footprints in general. One of the things we talked about last night was uh, the question, what? What's the most compelling evidence? What's the best, best evidence? 
And that's something I'm often asked when uh, you know, doing the interviews with journalists from documentaries. That's usually one of their you know, boilerplate questionnaire um, offerings or, or uh, collections. And I, I was read by last night that, that several responses uh, attempted to sort of take a step back and look at the big picture. Sometimes people become fixated. Skeptics often are fixated on that missing piece of evidence, their favorite missing piece of evidence. You know, I would, I would only believe, I would believe if only you provided this, and ignoring all the rest, all the compelling uh, and persuasive evidence, at least persuasive to the point that one should take this question very seriously as a legitimate scientific uh, line of investigation. When it comes to the footprints, though, which I still, and, and partly because of my background and my expertise and my appreciation of the significance of what was portrayed, you know, these are not just footprints. In other words, they're not just markings in the ground that record the passage or the, uh, uh, suggest the passage of something. But they contain so much information that um, allows us to evaluate the likelihood that that is credible evidence, that it's legitimate. Now, are, are the anatomies, the adaptations that are portrayed in the foot appropriate to a creature as described, uh, a profile in a sense, or a large, heavy, bipedal, hominoid creature. And so anyway, that, that's why this kind of discussion is so important that you appreciate it. It's not just footprints, there's so much more. So let's take a look at the mid-parcel First of all, on the lighter side, and I apologize to whoever it was that sent this to me originally, but it ended up in my, my photo file on my computer, but without attribution. And so I got a kick out of it because uh, if, if you look at it there, it says, you know, little known fact, Dr. Melbourne was a big fan of Mad Magazine. That's true, as a matter of fact. I still have, in fact, the uh, special Star Trek edition of the of <laughs> So you get a double wham there, double nerdy wham. All right. In fact, theories of flexible feet and compliant gait were most likely nurtured from this comedic source of entertainment, from this comedic. And it shows Captain Klutz there. Captain Klutz with his remarkably flexible feet. I was interested, I found it quite interesting when I was preparing this, I did a little a little search on the history of Captain Klutz. And he was created in the year, guess what? 1967, which has significance, uh, uh, just in the room, because that was when the Patterson Gillen built. So of course, Roger Patterson making this must have been inspired by See creating the uh, squares Captain around Klutz the space. and having incorporated that want, you see remarkable square. flexible foot in That's his, what you want. You want it in his in his like right about there. <laughs> so his head is under the sofa. <clears throat> As we talk about tarsus, the tarsus or the tarsal joint, the mid-tarsal joint is indicated there with a red line. And it's actually a compound joint. It's a pair of joints between the four largest, more proximal, more closest to the body uh, bones of the ankle region. So TA is talus, the ankle bone. Like I said, the talus and the calcaneus, the heel bone, you're probably more familiar with. But the cuboid and the navicular, two more added there, cuboid just in front of, distal to the calcaneus, and the navicular just in front of the talus. Now, that joint is, is really important. Um, more so, well, not I should say more so, in a different way, in the hominoid foot as an adaptive grasping organ. The human foot has tremendously reduced and restricted the range of motion at those joints in such a way that as you proceed through a step, they sort of twist and um, lock into a close packed position, meaning a position where the joint surfaces are most close and packed as they can be, they're most congruent and stable to support the body weight and it's, as it's being levered, uh, leveraged through the uh, toes during that final 
part of the set. Now, the grade eights, the chimpanzee representative of the grade eights over there on the right, you can see has the same bones, the same joints. It's just that the shapes are a little different and permit a different, and in this case, a much greater range of motion. Now, notice the area that I've highlighted in blue. That's actually the joint surface of the head of the ankle bone, the talus, downstream from the joint with the, with the shin bone, the tibia. But the exposed uh, extension of that blue surface upward indicates that that navicular, the kind of crescent-shaped bone in front of it, can twist and glide way up. You know, imagine the foot bending like Captain Klutz there. And that bone can ride up. But look over at the human. That smooth joint surface is very restricted because there's our foot just doesn't execute that movement anymore. Instead, we've emphasized the stiff longitudinal arch, so that our whole foot is a more stable platform that allows for more efficient leverage in, in uh, brisk walking and running. We, we have evolved, lightened our skeleton, we've lightened our muscular system uh, into lean, mean running machines. Now, I know that's kind of hard to imagine looking around the room and up on stage, because <laughs> we kind of drifted away from that optimal adaptation uh, in our sedentary lifestyle. But that's really what set us apart from our ancestors, is uh, lightning, lightning the load. You know, we're marathon runners instead of NFL linebackers. We uh, sprint and run down prey, endurance running. Um, and uh, persistence hunting instead of grappling. It's interesting, I mean, just to illustrate this point, there was a study done and published where the anthropologists carefully examined all the Neanderthal skeletons that they have in museum collections and so forth, and, and identified healed bone fractures. They then tabulated all those fractures and their pattern distribution, compared it to human medical records according to occupation. Guess, guess which occupation most closely resembled Neanderthal um, injuries? So it, 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 it could well have been, but it turned out it was uh, bull riders, rodeo bull riders, which really attested the fact that when they hunted, they didn't have the spear throwers, they didn't have bows and arrows. They had thrusting spears that you held onto as you thrust it into your quarry, which were oftentimes very large, um, you know, uh, intimidating animals like cave bears, like uh, uh, bulls or rhinos or so forth. And so they got in and really grappled with their prey. As a result, had a lot of these injuries. But in any case, all right. So that's, that's an important distinction now there. So this heritage of the much more flexible grade eight foot was an adaptation to what we call grass climbing holding on to the vertical support and going up that tree trunk. And so the foot had sort of a dual function, not only a propulsive, which in this case is exemplified in the movement of the heel segment as the calf musculature contracted and lifted up on the heel, but also had to maintain a grasp. You know, that's why the divergent thumb-like big toe evolved, uh, enlarged opposite the lateral digits, the remaining four digits make a pinch or grip there. And you can see the example in the chimpanzee going up that pole. There's another couple of examples. Now we still, especially when our weight to strength ratio was a lot lower, uh, we uh, tried to emulate that kind of uh, climbing behavior. As you can see, we do it in a slightly different fashion. We have a couple of options. Can't splay your big toe very far, especially not Western cultures that can find the feet in shoe wear all their lives, or just put it in opposite one another. You have to kind of use that inward force to create enough friction to keep from sliding down. All right, as a consequence of that mobility initially evolved in order to facilitate tree climbing, when that foot comes to the ground and say a chimp walks 
on a, on a terrestrial surface, as they go through that step, <clears throat> instead of the foot functioning as a stiff lever with the fulcrum, the pivot point at the ball of the foot, there's first a flexion at that very flexible mid-tarsal or mid-foot joint. And that expresses itself as the mid-tarsal break. Now, just a, a footnote, or pardon the pun. <laughs> that was intentional. <laughs> uh, but just, just a, to uh, clarify, because it sometimes is a little bit misleading, when you see in this instance the word break, it doesn't mean to damage it like you break a pencil. It means to flex. It's an axis of flexion. This paper breaks along the line of the fold, in other words. And so a mid-tarsal break is, is essentially mid-tarsal flexion. But you can see that decided angle there, as opposed to in the human condition at that point. Now the entire shape of the foot is, is elevated with the contact now limited to the ball of the foot. Now we sometimes think of the ball, usually it's at the base of the big toe, but oftentimes in the, in the terminology of foot functional, because the ball just means all the metatarsal heads, the metatarsal being those, those little um, bones in the inset. Okay. Too many things in my hands here. All right. So, you can see here, it's kind of interesting, when we can, we can further visualize this dynamic relationship in different ways. So, on the, um, on the bottom left is a plantar pressure reading. There's a device, it's just a thin film that has all these little microchips that sense compressive pressure, which then it color codes there, and so the hot spots are where there is concentrated pressure beneath the foot. And so as a chimpanzee walks on the ground, it tends to rock out onto the outside of the foot, but then as the heel comes up, now this is a snapshot, because obviously the dynamic is a dynamic process, so think of this as one still from a movie demonstrating the transition of plantar pressure as the foot moves through a step. But you can see the um, point indicated by the red arrow would be underneath that cuboid bone, right in front of the transverse tarsal joint, but on the out, concentrated on the outside of the foot. The other hot spot will be down the head of the metatarsal, that bone of the inset before the digit begins. If we look at footprints, and I did a study where we actually made the uh, sandbox, and I would, uh, and our, uh, not our, but my, my alma mater, I went back to SUNY Stony Brook to do this. Um, they had young chimpanzees that were, were um, very willing volunteers, very, very coddled volunteers uh, doing uh, uh, locomotor studies like this. And uh, they would, you know, they do just about anything for a handful of skittles or a squirt of Kool Aid. <laughs> and so it was very easy to coax them to walk across the sandbox and leave a nice. A uh, line of very fresh footprints, but you can see how that point of compression corresponds to the same area there under the plantar pressure on the uh, uh, on the force plate. Okay. Now in this case, there's really not any indication of a of of a, the mid tarsal break expressed in the footprint, other than the differential pressure beneath those points. Concentration. Okay. All right. And just to remind you of the difference in the human foot, we have this arch structure, and so there are instead of weight being distributed uh, evenly across the sole of the foot, it tends to concentrate under points of plantar pressure. Plantar meaning the sole of the foot. Plantar pressure under first the heel. Well, when the whole foot initially is in contact with the ground, but during the mid part of, of, of uh, the step, of the first part of the step, we have the heel and then the uh, principally concentrated under the ball of the foot at the base of the big toe. And then you can see the hot spot, a final push off through the big toe. Um, we've taken advantage, see, of the, of the pre-existing condition of this robust, thumb-like big toe of a chimp opposing the other digits. And we just kept that toe really big, so that instead of 
a grasping organ now, it's a propulsive organ, push knob. So that's where, the, where the, the weight shifts over to the medial, the inside of the foot, and out through the big toe. Okay. All right, now, um, my, uh, this is kind of interesting uh, tangent here, but it's important to, 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 to illustrate how easily some of these things can be mis, misconstrued. Um, my interest, or my, my noticing this feature of the Bigfoot tracks sort of refreshed my perspective on my viewing, my observation of fossil hominin tracks, our early ancestors like Lucy in East Africa three and a half million years ago, and the late holy hominin tracks in the Yash is the most the dramatic example that may come to mind. And um, in so doing, you know, I was drawing attention to some of these features, which we'll look at really briefly here, and arguing that these early hominins, in agreement with the, the rare skeletal elements that we have of the foot, were not walking like little humans on arched feet, as some had argued. And in fact, they had a mid-tarsal break, like I was describing with Sasquatch. It, 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 what we were seeing in Sasquatch was not novel. It wasn't odd and anomalous. It was. It had absolute precedent and was consistent with the hominin fossil record of, of fossil footprints. There was a, you know, a younger, there's a, foot, footprints was something, when I got involved in it, there were maybe, you could count the people in the anthropological discipline who were really focused on foot anatomy and fossil footprints. When those footprints were discovered in the 1970s, uh, by Mary Beeky, it really caught, another pun, it caught the discipline very flat-footed. And, and there wasn't much comparative data on um, unshod human populations to compare to. So there was this, this uh, uh, flurry of activity as these researchers were writing grant proposals and going off to various parts of the world, whether uh, in South America or Africa, to study these indigenous populations that had never worn shoe wear in their lifetimes because they wanted something like that to compare with the what they were seeing uh, in these barefooted hominids from three million years ago. In any case, um, the the work that, that I was part of uh, uh, inspired, you know, gratifyingly inspired a lot of uh, the next generation of, of anthropological students to, to follow suit to follow in our footsteps. Well, I'm going to rack up a whole bunch of them here today. <laughs> but one of them took a shot at me because they argued, they, they, they went down to a mall and laid out a, a force plate like that one you saw the chimpanzee walking on, and they, and they invited people to voluntarily you know, strip off their shoes and socks and walk on these force plates. And they found that 8% of a small sample of about uh, between 30 and 40 uh, volunteers exhibited a mid-tarsal break. So, so some of them, a typical, as we describe human, uh, you know, look at the pointer doesn't work, but on the far left is, the, is a typical sort of textbook human with a well-pronounced arch, and you can see the hot spots at the heel and across the ball of the foot and through the big toe especially, this one has a little bit through that uh, second toe. Second toe is probably a little bit longer. But this individual, and you can see it in the photo as well, looks much more like that chimpanzee foot, with, in the sense that the heel comes up and then there's a hot spot, right? And this is kind of a composite. You wouldn't see this, uh, this all at once, but uh, it's a composite of multiple skills from the film, as you might think of it. But the arrowhead indicates a pressure point under the cuboid, much like we saw with the chimpanzee. So he said, aha, see, humans can walk like this. So Dr. Melton's theory that the latest holy tracks were quite distinct from modern human forms of, of, of walking just doesn't have merit because we can see that some humans do. Well, yes, 8%. What does that tell me? That tells me that, yes, the fact that there is some variation in the expression of these characteristics in human simply attests to their recent innovation. That it's a fairly new adaptation, just a couple hundred thousand years old, not millions of years old, but it's not entirely fixed in the 
population of each of our individuals that show the primitive condition, which is what I've been arguing, that the longitude large, the human condition is a very recent innovation, and that walking on flat, flexible feet, like Sasquatch does, is a very adaptation that characterized early bipedal hominids. They have just retained it and had no reason, and, and, and absolutely no reason, given their body mass, it's not very advantageous to walk on a foot where all your pressure is poised over these limited points of contact. If you have a flat, flexible foot, not only do you distribute weight much more generally across that broad surface area, but the flexibility, instead of going up a tree trunk, where you need a grassy foot, but you're going up steep, irregular, rugged mountainsides all the time. How many of you have tried walking off trail up a steep slope? You know, it's challenging. You either have to jab your toes in like a mountaineer going up a glacier with, with crampons, or you turn sideways, right, and switch back in, so that your the long axis of your foot is more parallel to the to the angle, the slope of the, of the hill. So, anyway, kind of interesting. Uh, there were there were several others. Let me see if I've got them here. Well, not yet. We'll come back later. All right. So I got to move along. I'm, I'm digressing more than I intended to. So, 1996. I'm out at, at five points uh, outside of Walla Walla, Washington. Five points is just a little landmark where, where as it happens, five uh, uh, rural uh, roads converge at an intersection instead of four-way. Intersection is kind of a five-way intersection, the, the name five points so. But all three going to take me out to that spot to show me some footprints he discovered that very morning. And, and here's just a couple of, of examples from 35, 45 plus footprints in, a, in an extended trackway that was really an, an, an exceptional uh, example for me to have the privilege of uh, examining. But notice the arrowhead's indicating a feature that falls uh, without any previous or, or other information right now, approximately where we might expect the transverse parcel joint, where in a flat, flexible foot there might be some mobility, and um, that heel coming up off of the surface with now weight concentrated on the front half of the foot, um, it might push up some material. It's maybe more obvious in, in the one on the right where the soil was even more inundated with, uh, with the rainfall, as you can see. And so it's not just a little hump, a little steep hump, but it's an extrusion wave that came of the, the, the more liquidy mud that was squished out from under the forefoot into the heel. Well, when I saw that, you know, I thought, I've seen that before. And I remembered this image on the left from the from one of John it was actually John Green's book I think was uh, the first uh, published shot of that a, a photo was taken by Lyle Laverty who was a timber cruiser who investigated the scene seen in the Patterson of film the Monday after it was shot he was working up in that region with a a crew um, marking timber for salvage harvesting because of the floods that had ravaged that, uh, that canyon and exposed that huge sandbar that provided that un exceptional uh, view of Patty as she walked across that open space in the creek bottom. There you can see, and look at the similarity, I mean, especially like note the expansion cracks that run vertically as that material is yielding from the pressure under the forefoot and it humps up with nothing above it to restrain it. It expands upward and it cracks. And you get those vertical, let me see if I can try. You see those vertical cracks right there? And if we look here, boom, it's almost identical in fact. Right there, these vertical cracks. This is a cast that was made by Bob Titmus 10 days later. And he, he went and made 10 footprint casts in succession along the trackway. And fortunately, many of those, several, at least three or four, were represented in the photos that were taken by Lyle Lavery. So we have a really nice record of, of some of this information. 
So, <clears throat> so this really piqued my interest because I was quite familiar with the phenomenon of interpersonal break in chimpanzees, as had been described back in 1930 by Elfman and Mander in a published paper, kind of an obscure published paper. It had a lot of impact on, on, uh, on the anthropological community and did really explore the significance of it um, functionally uh, to a great degree. But I saw that, and uh, that had, had real significance to me. Now, again, look at this hominin. So, I, you know, this, this refreshed my thinking. I went back to the hominin track record. One of those prominent examples, as I've mentioned already, was the Laetoli hominin tracks from East Africa 3.7 million years ago. There's an artist reconstruction of, of based on skeletal morphology of what the feet of one of these early hominins might have looked like up there on the upper right. But here's a couple of uh, examples of footprints. The one on the <coughs> lower right was probably one of the most popularized pictures, not the most, it was probably the second most published picture from that trackway. Unfortunately, they chose, a, they, they chose another one that, uh, they chose another one that uh, was really two tracks, two footprints superimposed, slightly offset, which gave it a, a much more human-like outline, which many people, unfortunately, um, utilized to bias perception of onlookers that these tracks were basically little humans. Uh, but they're not. They look like a little chimpanzee with a non-divergent big toe, much more than they look like a little human. But a couple of other researchers, since we didn't have complete skeletal remains of a foot of the species that was given responsibility uh, for making these tracks, Australopithecus afarensis or Lucy, they cobbled together remains from different specimens, tried to make a composite foot to see how the foot fit, kind of a Cinderella operation there. Does the last foot fit or not? And you know, they came up with a pretty good, pretty good fit. But what stunned me is I looked at this is look at the red line. That would be the position of the transverse tarsal joint in their reconstructed foot. And look at the relationship to what is clearly a pressure ridge, much like I've shown you already. And others argued with me, no, no, that can't be a pressure ridge, you know. This these tracks are, are in compressed um, asphalt, and the ash would fall down in repeated waves, and so you get these uh, uh, successional lamina or layers. And then when you're excavating the imprint, see, and then, so you have the footprint, and then it kind of rained a little bit, and you got a little bit of a calcite patina on that last layer, but then more ash came in, filled the print. So when the prints were discovered, to really see the contact surface, you had to literally sort of chisel out, excavate the infill. And he said, you know, that they weren't really careful how they did it. It's probably artifacts of spalling off too many layers and spots. And then another person told me, oh no, there, there are these terrestrial termites, these subterranean termites that create burrows. And so they were burrowing through the ash and they burrowed through the footprint, and it just made that little gopher mound, basically. And I saw so that, that person, I showed several photos of other footprints in the trackway that had similar gopher burrows in exactly the same orientation, in exactly the same position of the I go, wow, these, these are really, what are they using GPS or something? Maybe they said, how, how they, I don't think so. And then I showed them examples, there were examples of such a, uh, burrows, but when they would hit the compacted ash of the footprint, <coughs> they'd make a right angle turn and follow the perimeter of the compacted ash, taking the path of least resistance around the footprint. The nail in the coffin came when I had the chance to go to Berkeley, and uh, um, Mike, uh, or Tim, I'm sorry, Tim White made all of his materials available to me. His, uh, his uh, stereo uh, photographs and so forth. And then I could really look at these prints and just jumping out of the page, just looking the, under the 3D viewer. And uh, he, he was very, very methodical in it. Uh, uh, 
the tracks were running basically north and south, and so he took one set when the sun was sort of over in the morning sky, and shadows were slightly cast in this direction, but then, so the details weren't lost or hidden by shadows, he took another set in the afternoon. And so you could put those two together and, and fill in any missing gaps. Really get the three dimension and the highlighting of the, of the strong side light. But in addition, he had um, fiberglass copies of casts that were made that had never been published, had never seen the light of day. And he brought these out and showed these. Here you might find these interesting. Well, yes, they were very interesting. Look over there. Now, where the red line is indicated, there is an extrusion artifact, a feature of, of the extrusion of, uh, of um, the wet ash. When this ash came down, it was a phreatic ash explosion, which occurs when you know, the magma comes up and hits the groundwater and creates steam and causes an uh, explosive eruption that just blows this wet, gloppy ash up into the air and it rains down in, in addition to uh, causing additional rainfall, you know, kind of seeding the any clouds. So, you know, you're walking through this wet and gloppy stuff, and, and that's an extrusion artifact. It's not an excavation artifact, as, as again, some of my critics try to argue, because it has a nice, smooth, rounded surface, just like the crest of a wave. It looks identical to instances, which you kind of see a little example, it's not the best one, where a material extruded up between the um, toe, the big toe, and the second toe. And it would extrude up and then poof, fall over like a you know, dairy queen, a little curly cue at the top. But the edge looked exactly the same as what we see there. Anyway, spend too much time on this, I gotta hurry. <laughs> All right, so there, uh, as the um, understanding of the fossil record of, of hominin feet became more complete, there were repeated statements like this from this researcher, Bariki. Uh, we have some fossil remains of hominin feet, and they indicate that our early ancestors had floppy, flexible feet. Kind of sound like Captain Klutz there. You know, very uh, similar description. All right, here's another one. This was one of my uh, professors at Stony Brook, and he was involved in the description and analysis of the Hobbit skeleton. And they had funny, odd feet. Long feet for their leg length, short big toes for their foot size, but the mid tarsus was indicative, like not exactly like the chimp, but showed a great deal of range of motion. So, Homo floresiensis had a short big toe and flat feet, and was probably a poor runner who walked with a high stepping gait to clear that foot. You know, exaggerated example would be you donning swim fins and walking down the beach to the water. You know, how you, if you don't turn around and walk backwards, which is a lot easier, you sit there, you have to lift your feet really high and keep from catching the tips of your fins. All right. So here we have another example of how this all started to come together for me. You know, I thought, well, let's, let's look uh, um, at this photo that was taken by Lyle Laverty and cast that was made by Bob Titmus. I had already, um, uh, for a different reason, um, taken this photo of Roger Patterson with the, the left foot there that is remarkably clear. You gotta realize he made his cast just almost immediately after the Sasquatch walked along that sandbar. The sandbar was not your typical beach sand. It was a very eroded slate with angular grains that interlocked, and then with the moisture of the rains that were occurring at that time, the imprint made a remarkable mold of the foot. Now remember, a footprint is not a mold of the foot. It is a record of the interaction of the foot with the substrate. So it's a dynamic record of a process, not a static mold of an object, okay? There's a slight difference. But in this case, it's pretty darn close to a mold of a foot. The detail is so great. Anyway, and based on the very remarkable outline and a few features like the one you can see, let's see if I can point to it, right here. That little bulge in this region corresponds to 
the what's called the navicular tuberosity. It's a protrusion of a bone to which a number of, or a, a pair of uh, stout tendons attach. And in our foot, because of the arch, it's up off the ground. It doesn't contact the ground unless you have flat pronated feet. In which case, your footprint will show that same protrusion. Um, so we can pick out some features we, we, uh, that give us an um, orientation landmark. We know that the, uh, up here, there's a little indentation. It hardly shows up in this photo, but on the uh, cast itself, you can see a slight indentation right there, which marks a flexion crease, much like you have a flexion crease across the palm of your hand that indicates the position of your joint, of uh, your knuckles. So since your palm extends past that joint, when you flex your knuckles, there has to be a crease to allow that palm to bend, same with the sole of the foot, and so on and so on. For time, I'm gonna to have to jump ahead here. But, so, what the, so this reconstruction in, uh, in drawn out here in outline, allows us then to infer the approximate position of the transverse tarsal joint. When you take that skeleton, superimpose it over the tipus cast, just like we did with the lay of you see, boom, there's the joint right in front of the pressure ridge, right in the proper relationship. All right, so here we can see a nice 3D scan up on top of the, um, uh, the tipus cast, so you can see that uh, it's exaggerated just a little bit. The scan uh, is exaggerated, the topography is a little bit. But it gives you a real good idea um, of the uh, effect of that pressure ridge. Now, now realize no one has drawn attention to this before I did. I'm mean, not to, to take you know, self-aggrandize here, but just to point out, this was completely a new novel concept when I started writing about it and talking about it. <clears throat> Anyone who had taken note of that speed bump in Lyle Laverty's photograph, seeing those twigs sticking off to the side, assumed that it was a branch, a green bough that was partially buried in the flood deposits on the bank, and that when, when Patty stepped, it pushed that bough down deeper, but then when weight was released, it bounced back up, creating a speed bump. <clears throat> well, there's no relationship whatsoever, and as you'll see, uh, why in just a minute. All right, so here is my interpretation, my reconstruction of the foot to, inter to uh, account for that speed bump. By comparison to the human, where the longitudinal arch produces that stiff platform, providing more optimal leverage for the calf musculature and the advent of a long, bungee cord-like Achilles tendon that serves as this fantastic elastic storage mechanism that returns a lot of energy back into the system when we're running on the balls of our feet. You know, much like a kangaroo is taking it to the nth degree, when kangaroos get up to a certain speed, their bounce uh, returns so much energy back into the system from the stretched tendons that, that the, uh, the metabolic demands of running just start to drop way down to a, uh, an optimal uh, or much more optimal level. In contrast, when the Sasquatch steps, first the heel comes up, pressure is now concentrated over the forefoot, which then will cause sometimes if the substrate is plastic or deformable, or there's enough forward impulse in the set to cause the material to yield to that pressure and buckle up to form a pressure ridge. Not to be confused with the negative space under the medial arch of the foot, which has a very distinctive appearance. Now I'm absolutely, literally, I, you know, it's not that you say 100% in science, but I'm 100% confident in that interpretation. Why? Because I can see the very thing I'm describing taking place by the track maker herself. And if you look at her trailing foot there, boom, see, you see that heel first come up just a little bit and then in right in the center, and I'll show you a still so you can focus on it, but I want to show you something else. Here. Actually, it's the next one that did help you out a little bit there. <clears throat> There's a point where her heel segment is almost perpendicular to the substrate. 
she was using false feed, like uh, Brent Mullins or Ray Wallace's ridiculous hard feed. The feed would have to be jutting eight, six to eight inches down into the soil at that instant of that picture, or that, or that film, rather. But they're not. It's just that they're flexed. Now, here's another real interesting insight. And when we did that proof, um, proof is out there, documentary allowed us to kind of show it a little more oomph. But one of the things, we snap back really fast, if you look, if you look at that image, a lot of people would look at that and uh, they would say, Sasquatch have these little short peas in a pot kind of toes. And in fact, Grover Krantz, who didn't have an appreciation of the significance of the mid dorsal prey, had argued using the logic that our toes have gotten re remarkably shorter with the advent of the arch to reduce bending stress as they get shorter and straighter instead of, uh, as compared to the long curved digits of the chimp. Um, they don't tolerate these bending stresses when they push off. In fact, chimps to avoid those stresses will sometimes walk with their feet clenched like a fist. They just curl those round, or um, they uh, curl those curly toes underneath and walk basically on their foot and knuckles. But so, um, flat, flexible feet, I'm sorry, uh, short, stubby toes. But if it is a flat, flexible foot, if my interpretation is correct, and I might read that that flexion crease is right, those are long toes, aren't they? Really quite long by comparison to the overall foot length. Well, what do we see when we look at the film closely? Look at that lead foot. You see those toes pointing up? I mean, it looks like Captain Clutz there with the... Those are the exact same toes that I drew in an outline on that reconstruction. All right. And there you can see on the still. So on the far left, the heels just begin to come up. In the middle, it's perpendicular. It's upright. And then, of course, the weight or the the, uh, the uh, weight is transferred through the forefoot. It pushes off. And at that point, the body mass is really over the lead foot now, which is taking up the support. So there's not a lot of propulsion through the toes. Most of the push off comes through the forefoot. That's where the deepest parts of the track are. Now, oftentimes people look at this and say, why is the foot so light colored? Why is the sole of the foot so light colored? Well, tell me, why is the sole of that chimpanzee so light colored? People look at this and they go, look at the, look at the outline of the hair. It's so perfect. It's got to be a fake foot with the fur just sewed onto the edge of the artificial sole. Well, again, you tell me, this is a chimpanzee. It looks identical. It's absolutely identical. When you have extremely thick skin and there's a thick layer of dead tissue, it has a lighter hue usually than the surrounding um, tissue or even the you know, comparison to the hair. But on top of that, when it comes to the Patterson Gillen film, when her foot is directed backward, it's catching directly off the, the sunlight. And the smooth hair of the skin is reflecting more light than is the hair-covered parts of the body, just as the surface of the sandbar uh, illustrates it. The film is a little bit overexposed, and it causes the foot to look excessively white. But you don't have to force that explanation very far when you look at something like this. And there's the mid-tarsal break in exactly the same spot. All right, so let's go ahead. Now let me just, uh, as I mentioned, Bob Tippis came to the site 10 days later, cast 10 tracks in succession. What was really, uh, oftentimes, uh, and I preface this uh, by saying that oftentimes people have taken my explanation and say, well, okay, that, you say that, but then why do you only have one example? Why is there just one foot of those 10 that shows a mid partial break? Why wouldn't they all? You know, it does depend somewhat on the substrate consistency and the and the uh, you know the force vectors of walking itself. But watch this; these are three scans of those ten tracks that Bob Tippis um, cast. And lo and behold, when you look at them from the right angle, where you can appreciate the topography, they nearly all have indications of of a pressure ridge. And in fact, if you read Dr. Kranz's book, you know, he tries to kind of explain why um, some of these tracks are kind of short. And he talks about how, you know, two footprints are never exactly the same, depends on the depth, 
imprint and on if there's any translation horizontally in the substrate and so forth. The simplest explanation actually is they're flat, flexible feet. She's walking rather briskly. She tends to be up on the front. You ever see people who kind of walk up on the balls of their feet? Um, she's walking up on the forward part of her foot. The heel is only pressing uh, partially in some of these. And when you look at the position of the arrows, it's remarkably consistent relative to the toe, to the toe end of the foot. Oh, what's it doing? Relative to toe end of the foot, the greatest variation is in the depth of the imprint of the, of the heel segment. So, perfect explanation. All right, move on. Okay, and there are other examples. Here's one that's where it's very clear. You know, here, the pressure release was a little more dramatic, uh, and so my point is not a little more dramatic, and so it's not just a simple speed bump, but there actually is some more extrusion, more extrusion-like artifact. There's some displacement of the substrate, what we call a pressure disc, instead of a pressure ridge. All right, here's another interesting insight. Famous photograph, from newsprint photograph of Jerry Crew with the 1958 um, footprint. I'll lean on this elbow now so I feel like I'm ignoring me. <laughs> Take it with an old style camera with probably a big flash bulb flash, you know, and uh, wash it out. You see that strong shadow behind him? And when you do that, it kind of washes out your especially things that are up in the foreground. So it looks remarkably flat. Well, I had the privilege of, of visiting John Crew, um, the son who's now the custodian of the footprint. He was kind enough to let me actually open up the shadow box and carefully unwire and lift that cast out to examine it. And you turn it on its side and boom, what do you see? There's a pressure ridge in exactly the same spot. It's the exact same morphology. Absolutely. Then I got to go to China which was a fantastic opportunity, uh, thanks to Monster Quest. And, uh, of course, in China, they have the Yeren, the wild man. But in, in all wild accounts, the descriptions are remarkably similar to Sasquatch. It makes perfect sense, and that's where Asia has to be where Sasquatch, a large hominoid species, must have originated uh, and, and emigrated into North America as did 75% of the other species of mammals occupying North America today. Okay, people realize that three quarters of the mammals you're familiar with actually are immigrants from China, from Asia. Um, I, one, one of our interviews involved a, a, a gentleman named Mr. Yuan, who had been to central China with the Red Army as part of the contingent that was conducting research into the year the wild man question. He was apparently enamored with the site. He mustered out of the service and settled in Hubei and became a park ranger in the newly formed Shenjia uh, Nature Reserve. While he was on patrol, he had a sighting. Saw a year, real short story. Found some tracks, made a couple of plaster casts. So we were going to examine his casts and interview him about his experience. We were, he didn't speak a, a, a word of English. So you know, not much communication going on, but uh, on our way in the in the shuttle to the location that we were going to set up the interview, uh, a location they chosen, um, they wouldn't let me see the cast until the cameras were rolling. They wanted my initial reaction to be recorded. <laughs> but in the, in the meantime, I hand him a, a reprint of a paper that I had written, which featured this illustration. And he couldn't read it, couldn't appreciate it, but you know, so he went to the pictures and, and saw that. And oh, he got excited. He grabs my, shh, my coat sleeve, he's turning on it, and he's gone. And he's nodding, I said, okay, okay, yeah, sure enough. He gets to get inside, he opens up his little suitcase, now comes the towel, and then boom, there's his footprints. Now they're kind of washed out, with a really terrible setup for a photograph with that white background. I tried to. I tried to uh, touch up the contrast as best I could, but there are the footprints. I mean, they're about as close as you can reasonably get to the Titmus casts. Relatively the same size, just a little bit wider, a little bit more robust, but the same pressure is, same position, same aim, slight angulation. 
Um, here you can see them compared more closely and with the angled shots and the profile, just greater depth, they were pressed into some soft mud on the bank of a spring and you tracked it through the woods and then when it came to the spring, it, it squatted down. So it really accentuated the flexion of the hind uh, of the midfoot, you know, coming up, you know, as we would squat and poise on the balls of our foot, when they squat, their foot flexes through that transverse partial joint, the heel comes up all the way over the forefoot and toes, and you can see that, uh, that depth of impression. But I was just flabbergasted. I mean, for me, you know, you ask for a smoking gun, that's your smoking gun. There you see, but, and look at this, the dates. He cast that in 1995. Yes, the Titmus cast was first photographed in 1967, but I first published a description of the significance of the pressure ridge, what is it, 1999. There's another example from the Blue Mountains outside of Walla Walla that shows the morphology excellently from 1991. Now, where did these guys get the inspiration to include this odd feature in these footprints? And to do it in such a way, because I've seen examples of people who tried to embellish their, quote, discovered footprint by introducing a pressure ridge themselves. I mean, it's absolutely, they don't admit it to me, but that's what happened because it's in the wrong place, it's a long orientation. And, uh, but that's the first thing they point out to me. Look at this pressure ridge. <laughs> All right, another line of evidence that corroborates this are the half tracks. Um, we talked about this flexion. I got a hustle here. Um, you can see that when, when, well, let's just jump ahead here. When you or I run, we're up on the balls of our foot because of that stiff arch. We leave this little abbreviated footprint. It's almost like a five you know, dog pop. But that's because our foot is poised like that illustration there. Compared to the Sasquatch, when it runs, it can't balance up on the ball of the foot. Its foot doesn't have an arch. To support that posture, the foot um, drops into flexion across the transverse tarsal joint and looks like that interpretation of this footprint. So these are examples of these half tracks where it's running. And I started finding these bills were from the blues outside of Walla Walla. This got me thinking about that whole thing. And then this incident came to my attention. I think it was first with Dr. Henry Fahrenbach who brought it to my attention. And he said, this is a lot of saying about these, these uh, half tracks, these, uh, or these partial tracks. He didn't call them half tracks, these are partial tracks. And, and, I, and then I asked him, I said, well, well, describe that to me. He said, well, it's just, you know, it's uh, right about half of the foot, maybe two thirds of the length of the foot. And, and uh, sure enough, when I got to see them, there's the half track he was describing. And when you superimpose it over the full track, which is remarkably clear, you know, much like the clarity of the Patterson Gillen film, um, it uh, it corresponds to it terminates at the transverse tarsal joint. And what's also interesting, those the two little side red arrows. When you superimpose it with all that weight focused on the front half of the foot and the increased impact force due to the running. The sole pack has expanded laterally, and it has sort of filled in the contours, and it has a more, more dislike shape than the normal walking um, track. That's amazing. And to further confirm that it wasn't just a fluke that somebody ran out of plaster, you know, especially with that irregular edge, you know, that's just a break because it was quite attenuated right there. Um, at one of the town hall meetings, someone came up to Cliff and said uh, they had been at the site. Um, uh, Hereford had some plaster still left, mixed plaster still in the bucket uh, that he was using. He noticed a, a couple that were looking very, with great interest at the whole season. He said, would you like to use up my plaster? And so they made another cast. And so it confirms that yes, there were these half tracks. We don't have any photographs of Per se, the half tracks. Okay, really quick. Cliff, when, when uh, Finding Bigfoot did, uh, you know, you have to give me an indulgence a little bit. When uh, Finding Bigfoot came to Pocatello finally, they did a little, I must say, a rather gratuitous visit to my lab. I think they just didn't want me to upstage anybody, you know, so. <laughs> but 
But uh, it gave Cliff, when he had some free time, the opportunity to come back. And he spent the whole afternoon in the lab. And, uh, and I just, you know, just turned him loose. And um, he at one point said, Jeff, come look at this. He said, aren't, aren't these the same individual? You know, this was a question that he has emphasized, that I had emphasized from very early on. And I, and I had lots and lots of examples uh, of such. I looked at that and I said, well, you know, I've often wondered that, but, but there was someone, who will who, who leave it one name, who made a big deal about the difference in the angle of the tow rope. And he said, you, you, know, you can't change that. Um, that's, that, that's not a, a malleable characteristic. So I kind of always just pushed it onto the back burner. And he says, yeah, but look at that big toe. Look at that distal toe pad. I mean, that's pretty distinctive individual characteristic. I said, I know. Yeah, I've often thought about that. And, and the little toe flaring out, kind of like banana-shaped little flare out to the lateral side. And then, you know, sometimes it takes someone asking a question of an investigator to think about something in a new way. And I go, well, look at this. If, if they are, then the toes have to line up. So if we rotate it, you know, we, we can take a footprint regardless of its, its confirmation and just like you were hanging it on the wall, swinging from a nail, you know, we hang it vertically with a, an imagined long axis. <laughs> But I said, if, if the toes, if, if they're the same, the toes have to line up. If you line up the toes, turn to line up the toes, then boom, the forefoot lines up perfectly. The inside edge of the forefoot line up perfectly. The only difference is in the heel segment. And look at where the flexion point is. It's right where the transverse tarsal point would, or joint would be. This is an example of what we call supination and pronation. These are two tracks of the same individual, same human individual. One, the, they were instructed to walk putting weight on the outside of their foot. And in so doing, when you do that, you, you naturally tend to turn your knee outward. And if you, even sitting there in your chairs, turn your knee outward, you can feel how it lifts up the inside of your foot. If you turn your knee inward, it pushes the inside of your foot down. Pronation, you've probably heard. Some of it's um, excessively heavy. Sometimes their arches will collapse and their knees will knock and their feet will roll inward, pronated. So there you can see an illustration that uh, explains those two footprints. So basically what we're seeing is that same phenomenon. We're seeing a perfect example, again, another smoking gun. A perfect example of this normal function of Pronation, supination. Oh, really fast. One, one or two more slides. Um, pathology, crippled foot, very well um, uh, widely discussed and, and, and widely debated. A lot of criticism, a lot of question, part, part because of the people involved. Ivan Marks, who was a notorious hoaxer. But like they say, you know, blind squirrel, even a blind squirrel finds it good enough once in a while. And this was one. This, there's just no way. His, and his hoaxes further, in my mind, substantiate that. Because the anatomy, the subtlety is so profound here by comparison to the transparent hoaxes. His little snowman dancing through the snow with the saggy baggy white costume you've seen. <laughs> I mean, that's, they're just uh, really amazing. But anyway, the, the, the thing, this was actually the case that really persuaded Dr. Robert Prance. And it was that uh, the presence of these bumps on the deformed foot. Now I could talk for another 20 minutes, but I'm not going to get turned off here. Uh, on this, it's really fascinating. I discussed this with all kinds of clinicians. I was invited to uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, gave the winter's uh, uh, lecture on, to the entire orthopedics and, and uh, podiatry department uh, division of the hospital and the local community uh, practitioners. And they were just Amazing. I mean, they, they didn't have a dog in the fight about whether Bigfoot exists, what the implications of the existence of Bigfoot would be, but they were just trying to diagnose this. There's actually a copy of these casts on display in the department office in the Department of Podiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital as a result of that. All right, real quick, let me jump to, oh, oh, we'll go through this, I want to just get to the very end. So, oh, I got to say one quick word about this. Because if you read Dr. Daglin's book, you know, um, he again takes me to task and presents this as evidence how a human foot can show a mid-tarsal pressure ridge. 
well, if you can't see the difference between that photograph and the Titmus cast, uh, you can. I mean, you can obviously see it. He should be able to see it. And this is absolutely disingenuous because I, I've had conversations with him and students. Um, another young upstart of this, of this uh, subsequent generation, Dr. David Day, uh, David Reichman, published these photogrammetric scans of human feet to try to also illustrate how humans leave mid partial pressure ridges, and it's not um, a distinctive characteristic that would differentiate us from hominids. Well, again, look at this. This is a disc. Here's the leading edge of the disc back where the arrowheads are, but you have to follow it back. Where did that disc, or uh, the pressure creating that disc originate? At the ball of the foot. And these are, you know, they're human feet with well developed arches. They don't show any sign of, of uh, mid tarsal. I mean, totally misread. The problem with these younger scholars is that they get so myopic into the um, collection of data that they don't sit back and look at the picture. I, I can guarantee you, none of these guys has gone and walked on the beach and walked, watched how people just walk and looked at their own footprints on the beach hour upon hour upon hour until someone gets you a dirty look and which has happened to me. <laughs> okay, one last one. Matt Crowley, aka the tube, he made a big deal of making false feet which produced pressure ridges, he said. And more pressure ridges. Pressure ridges that aren't consistent. How, you know, they make perfect sense when you look at the artificial foot that he's using. This is flexible rubber foot. But a living foot has a skeleton. Its our points of articulation are limited by those bones and their proportions. So all of these lines of evidence, the pathologies, the dynamics, the normal dynamics of, of supination and pronation, the pressure ridge, the half tracks, they all confirm this model. So when you hear someone says, well, yeah, Dr. Milgram's theory, okay, Often that's construed in the colloquial sense of a theory, which you can look at in the dictionary as a guess. But in the scientific sense, even though they were really being, uh, being um, uh, complementary, a theory is a coherent explanation based upon numerous observations of, of a set of related phenomena. Well, of course, that's, that's a theory. But as far as I'm concerned, you know, I say, we rarely say uh, convinced 100%. I can tell you with 99.99999% confidence that that is the fundamental distinguishing characteristics of the Sasquatch book. All right, thanks so much.